world leads inexorably to a complete neglect of worldliness. In writing, a complete neglect of worldliness leads to graphomania. And so anyone who writes and drinks is in a tough situation. <laughs> I drank, and I did not neglect writing, and now with a drunkard's tear in my eye, I am writing about a washing machine that has been neglected through drink. Oh, if I had found within myself not so much a curiosity about the worldly fault and its workings, but if I had simply found a free moment, a moment of free will, then naturally I would have had the appropriate person repair the washing machine. But I found within myself neither the one thing nor the other. Neither hour, nor daily, nor bread. My first wife eventually got used to the permanently unrepaired washing machine and stopped nagging me. And she left me without nagging. My second wife left before she had gotten used to it and before she started to nag. Which is a perfect introduction to remind everyone that after this, um, we're all <laughs> We're all going to meet up informally at Tapas downtown for drinking and eating, um, but we will not drink away any washing machines. Um, now, one of the things about Open Letter and about the University of Rochester and the literary translation programs for undergraduates and graduates is that translation really is at the core of this and the process of translation. So I'm really pleased that up next, uh, Claudia Schaefer and, and Jackie Knapp are going to read a passage from Jorge Bolby's Season of Ash, but read it both in English and in Spanish. So both of you. First, but this is kind of unfair. There's absolutely no humor in this book, and we're following <laughs> hard out here. Um, this is Jackie's been working all semester with a Colombian novel whose characters are Chinese and Polish, so this one has Russian names in it. Um, we'll try to get through and show you what it's like. Enough rot howled Anatoly Dyatlov. The alarm went off at 1:29 a.m. Moving at 300,000 kilometers a second, the photons passed through the screen, rendered brick-colored by the dust, pierced the air saturated with smoke from Turkish, Turkish cigarettes, and following a straight line through the control room, smashed into his pupils just before the blare of a siren, traveling at a mere 1,200 kilometers per hour, reached his eardrums. Unable to distinguish between the two stimuli, his neurons generated an electric whirlwind that engulfed his body. While his eyes focused on the scarlet iridescence and his ears were thrashed with sound waves, his neck muscles tensed, the glands in his forehead and armpits accelerated the production of sweat, his limbs stiffened, and without the assistant to the engineer noticing, adrenaline infiltrated his bloodstream. Despite his 10 years of experience, Anatoly Mihailovich Dyatlov was dying of fright. A few meters away, another chain reaction was following a parallel course. In one of the side panels, the mercury was flying to the top of an old thermometer, while the iodine and cesium particles were becoming unstable. It was as if those inoffensive elements had plotted a revolt, and instead of being suspicious of each other, had joined to destroy the bars and torture the guards. The creature wasted no time in taking control of reactor number four in an open challenge to the emergency rules. It was taking revenge and accepting no excuses. It would execute its captors and establish a kingdom of its own. Ever more powerful, it sped to conquer the plan. If the humans did not take immediate steps, the massacre couldn't be contained. Thousands would die. And the Ukraine, Bielorussia, perhaps all of Europe, would be forever devastated. By the way, this is a parallel between the victims of capitalism and the victims of Chernobyl. Happy thing. Pasta de podredumbre, yo Anatoly Diatlov. La alarma se encendió a la 1.29 de la mañana. Desplazándose a 300.000 kilómetros por segundo, los fotones traspasaron la pantalla. El polvo la volvía color ladrillo. Atravesaron el aire saturado a cigarros turcos y siguiendo una trayectoria rectilínea a través de la sala de controles, se precipita precipitaron en sus pupilas poco antes de que el zumbido de una sirena a solo 1.235 kilómetros por hora llegase hasta sus tímpanos. Incapaz de distinguir los dos estímulos, sus neuronas produjeron un torbellino eléctrico que se extendió a lo largo de su cuerpo. 
mientras sus ojos se concentraban en el titileo escarlata y sus oídos eran azotados por las ondas sonoras, los músculos de su cuello se contrajeron hasta el límite. Las glándulas de su frente y sus axilas aceleraron la producción de sudor. Sus miembros se tensaron y sin que el asistente del ingeniero en jefe se percatase, la droga se infiltró en su torrente sanguíneo. Pese a sus 10 años de experiencia, Anatoly Mihailovich Diadlo se moría de miedo. A unos cuantos metros, otra reacción en cadena seguía un curso paralelo. En uno de los paneles laterales, el mercurio ascendía a toda prisa por el tubo de un viejo termómetro, mientras las partículas de yodo y cesio se volvían inestables. Era como si esos inofensivos elementos hubiesen tramado una revuelta y en vez de desconfiar unos de otros, se uniesen para destrozar las rejas y torturar a los custodios. La criatura no tardó en apoderarse del reactor número 4, en abierto desafío a las leyes de emergencia. Clamaba una venganza sin excusas, la ejecución de sus captores, un reino solo para ella. Cada vez más poderosa, se lanzó a la conquista de la planta. Si los humanos no tomaban medidas urgentes, la masacre se volvería incontenible. Habría miles de muertos. Y Ucrania, Bielorrusia y acaso toda Europa quedarían devastadas para siempre. The next book that's going to be read from is the Museum of Eterna's novel, which is subtitled The First Good Novel, um, and has a, a partner book called Adriana Buenos Aires, The Last Bad Novel. And this is a book that I could literally talk about for the next 25 minutes, because for at least seven years I wanted to publish this in English. So when it finally came out a couple of months ago, it was really like monumental for me and, and overwhelming. And it's actually um, the next book of ours to be reviewed in the New York Times on May 16th, and God, please let this be a good review. <laughs> Please, um, and hopefully if anyone from the New York Times is watching this, like Gregory Cowles, you can uh, make sure that it is. Now anyways, um, Macedonia was an interesting and strange guy. Like, he, we, we've always wanted to have these t-shirts that said, like, eccentric dudes and had, like, some of our author's names on the back, because we have the weirdest authors. Macedonio um, lived in Argentina. He was Borges' mentor, and he ran for president of Argentina twice with his whole entire um, campaign consisted of writing his name, Macedonio, just his first name on little note cards and leaving them at cafes all around the city because that would infiltrate human consciousness and people would just vote for him because his name was so beautiful, um, which is awesome. So going from like the, the Chernobyl and, and capitalism, end of capitalism, we get crazy Macedonia. He also supposedly started a, a utopia in the, for, in the jungle, um, but it didn't last more than a week because the mosquitoes were too bad, um, so, so he gave up. But he also, amid all of his weirdness, and this is the only time I'm going to violate and read something myself, um, among all of his weirdness, he wrote this book, um, which is strange and postmodern and ahead of its time and has like 52 prefaces before the actual novel starts. And in these prefaces, he also wrote what I believe to be like the most romantic paragraph ever. Um, and I'm going to indulge myself here because this is my favorite thing ever. Okay, so here's from Introducing Eterno, who the whole book is dedicated to, um, which turns out in Macedonia's real life. Um, and you can find out more about this on 3% or our blog. We have a audio thing that's going up tomorrow that was a long, an hour and a half long panel about Macedonia and all these stories are, are told in there. But um, after his wife died tragically, he had this long, lifelong love affair with this woman and that's who this book is actually dedicated to but no one really ever talked about that until after everyone was dead. Anyways, this is the paragraph. You still don't believe it. I didn't see you coming either. The impossibility that you are. The impossibility of an answer to death, yet I have it. The all love that you are, the all knowing that was mine. Whether you exist or not, I dedicate this work to you. Beauty eternal, you are at the very least what is real in my spirit. And Meredith is going to read something else from Macedonia. Wow. 